Well, greetings, everyone. I'm David Arendelle. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I'm sharing with you a speech that I gave in October 2019 at a conference for peer study group programs that was hosted at Wollongong in Australia. I made some modifications to the talk and wanted to be able to share that with you for today. First of all, I just want to give a shout out to all of the things that I've learned from my new colleagues in New Zealand and Australia and other portions of Southeast Asia. A great deal of research and publications have come out about peer learning programs. I just simply, for those of you who are uh, watching this on YouTube, you're seeing the slides. For those of you listening on the podcast, you'll need to download the PowerPoint slides, which will be one of the handouts, which will be available for you. I make a point not to read the uh, slides to people. It's something that my students um, didn't want me to do inside of a history class, and I agree with them. Well, there's a lot of great research that's going on, and in fact, one of the things that I've learned is some of the best models for online academic support and also uh, something which is just now beginning to spread inside the United States called Students as Partners. It's an important new uh, way of looking at the relationship of the students as an equal partner with the learning that goes on inside of the classroom. But that's a subject for other people to talk about on other YouTube or podcast episodes. Well, to start off, what is it that we already know about how to be able to build stronger relationships with our students? So let me just do a really quick survey here of some of the relevant research. Dr. Alexander Astin is one of the top experts on looking at how does college have an impact upon students. And if you boil it all down, I still highly recommend that you get a copy of his book because it is so important in terms of understanding all of the different factors that have an impact on students. There's hundreds of variables. But if you wanted to just boil it all down to, how does college make an impact on students? Well, it has something to do with the time of exposure. When does that exposure begin and when does it end? So it's this quantity of the experience, whatever it is, whether it's inside of a study group, it's inside the classroom, it's inside of a club, it's uh, the new relationships which are being formed with other students. And then also, it's the intensity of the exposure. What's kind of the quality of what it is that they're getting out of this interaction? And that's what he says. It's a good way for you to be able to figure out why do things have an impact? And that's part of the reason why it's critical that students on a regular basis take advantage of their peer study group programs. Because the more they go, the more impacts that are going to occur for them. This one is really looking at customer research on what it is that causes them to come back, whether it's to buy more products at the store, whether it is to uh, purchase more uh, athletic tickets in order to watch a team, or why is it that students are going to continue to come back to study group sessions? Well, it's going to be every single time we know from the research that people make a decision whether to come back again or not because there's only so much time, only so much money, and it's on the basis of the quality of that experience on whether they're going to come back again or not, and then that has a direct impact on what kinds of outcomes they're going to receive. One of the things that's really surprising from the research is that sometimes all it takes is one relationship with somebody at the institution that helps you to decide, I'm going to continue to come back. One of the things that's remarkable about this one relationship impact, it actually doesn't make a lot of difference who that one person is. It could be a college president, a faculty member, a club sponsor, a study group session leader. The, the, the critical in this is, does that other person know who I am? 
does that other person know me by my first name? And for people, they need to have that interaction with at least one other person to help encourage them to continue to come. Now, in terms of a staying environment, what kind of an environment, you know, nowadays we tend to talk about campus climate. Well, the American College Testing Program does a lot more than just simply um, create an examination that's used by many colleges to determine whether you're admitted to um, colleges inside of the United States. They also do an awful lot of research about student retention and persistence towards graduation. Sometimes people just kind of focus a lot about the academic issue. And that's one of the reasons why lots of colleges, nearly universal, all have some version of a study group program because they know the value of it for helping them to do better in their progress towards their academic goals, getting higher grades. But also, ACT also found there's all kinds of social and psychological reasons that help to build an important climate on campus for encouraging students to continue. And one of the themes that you're going to be seeing coming out of this particular short talk is the whole issue about belonging. If a student feels like they belong on the college campus, well, then they're going to deal with all of the other turmoil in their life, their life, work, study skill, balance, the challenges that they're dealing with, they need to know that this environment on campus is going to be supportive. Also, you see the other social psychological issues, social integration, personal involvement of them with other activities. For them, whether they are seeing themselves in a more positive light, and also, are they feeling better about themselves? And do they see themselves making progress, not only academically, but also personally? Sometimes for me as a faculty member, I just retired out after 40 years, I don't really know what sometimes my students are thinking because I primarily have taught first-year students over my academic career 40 years. Well, the ACT company, again, they did lots of surveys to find out what do first-year students, what kinds of issues are they dealing with? And you end up seeing this is a list of common expressions of feelings that students were having. I'm scared. I feel like I'm giving up. I feel totally lost and confused. And then all the other ones in the list. This is the reason why peer study group programs can be so important because that can be a place where students can feel a safe environment to express their emotions, ask out to other students how do they deal with these. So it's not only just about the study group leader, but it's also about the other students who are inside of the study group sessions and it forms a community. And this supportive community creates their own climate let's call it, their own supportive place where they know that it's a safe place for them to come and talk about issues. So whenever you look at all of these here, a couple of them kind of relate to academics, but oftentimes the reason why students drop out of college is not because they're having low marks in all of their classes or they have a whole series of major examinations that they all have low marks in. The research shows that in the United States, students drop out of college most often with a passing or even a high grade point average. Isn't that something? Well, it's not surprising because the students may have been really successful in high school and then they get into an entirely different environment and they start to experience things that they never experienced before and it's pretty confusing. And if they can't find a way to deal with these kinds of feelings here in this list, well, they're going to maybe make a decision, I don't belong, even though they have passing grades or even maybe even higher grades. Probably one of the most cited people about student persistence and graduation rates from colleges is Dr. Vincent Tinto. 
And many years ago, he came up with six major themes of why it is that students quit going to college. Whenever you see this list of six up here, well, the two of them, which seem to resonate with a lot of people in terms of why they have a college study group program, or it's the first two, difficulty level and handling day-to-day -day life, uh, incongruence, what's going on inside the classroom, what I'm being assigned to read, the assignments I'm being asked to do, and what it is that I understand, well, they're incongruent. I just can't make a link between those. And many times this is where the focus for lots of student retention programs is about helping out academically. But what Tinto has been telling us consistently for decades is there's also mostly social reasons why students are dropping out of college. They're just having a hard time making a difficult adjustment, even if they were a high-performing student in their secondary education. They feel socially isolated. The research has shown that students actually date less. They interact with people less. Part of that is because of their time crunches. They're working two and three part-time jobs to help pay for the tuition. And necessarily, the people who you work with at your job sites aren't necessarily going to be talking about or trying to find ways to encourage you academically. And also, sometimes students randomly select students to study with. That's what you would call a social group. And sometimes students don't make the best selections of what other students to study with. So it very well may be it's a negative group. They really aren't highly committed to the grades. They'd rather party. Or they don't have very effective strategies for studying. Lots of things that all go on. We could spend an entire hour just trying to unpack Dr. Tinto's work, but I just wanted to illustrate some of the research that's helping us understand why the personal part, the belonging part, is so critical for helping students to be able to persist in college. Well, a term that you're going to see me use often inside this talk is PASS, P-A-S-S. -S. stands for Peer Assisted Study Sessions. Sometimes it's also an abbreviation for a, another term that's close to that. PASS is a common term that's used in New Zealand, Australia, and in other parts of the United States, excuse me, in uh, other parts of the world. So, just so you know, that's what I mean when I talk about PASS programs. Well, you know, so much focus has always been put upon grades. And it's the grades are why you end up having these past programs. But there's so much more. And that's the reason why the rest of this talk is going to have a great deal to focus on in terms of the non-grade outcomes that occur because of involvement in past programs. Because sometimes administrators on college campuses want to know, well, what more is there? How do I really know this program is having an impact? Is it only about improving their quiz scores or some of their assignments? Maybe grades aren't the best indicator of change really occurring. Now, once again, we could go and spend another hour just talking about whether or not grades and such are good indicators of learning outcomes. That's a whole other subject for another set of experts who could be able to talk about that one more deeply. But all I simply want to get across is this is the reason why you're going to see this focus here about other things that are outcomes because you've been involved in a study group program. One of the key concepts is co-curricular. Co-curricular means these are things which are occurring that students experience that are in addition to what happens inside the classroom, field trips, independent study, travel abroad programs. But these co-curricular activities, they're all having important outcomes. And that's what we're going to be doing a lot of focus on in the remaining few minutes here of me being able to share with you. And this is something that really resonates well whenever you're trying to promote or expand a study group program. You're a lot more than just simply powerfully helping them to get higher grades. 
you're also part of the curriculum. And that's the reason why it's so critical to have important ties among the study group leaders, the participants, the faculty members, the staff members. And that's the reason why I've been, uh, it's a real, been a real education for me as I've been learning much more about the concept of students as partners. That is a concept that's not very well understood or explored here in the United States. And I'll have to admit, it was a real wake-up call for me whenever I was at the conference over in Australia, because I understand that this concept is something which is being implemented widely in New Zealand, Australia, uh, the United Kingdom, if you just do and go and do a Google search, most of your publications are going to come out of authors and researchers from those places. Now you're beginning to see a little bit more about that in the United States. So once again, talking about the past program here, I'm kind of focusing on this culture of belonging. What is it that we can do to help students to feel like they belong? So we're talking about what is it we can do about the climate. So we're talking about the leaders of these study group programs, the participants, the past staff members, and also some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are things that the class instructors can do. All of us are involved in this whole thing. And I, will, I may not be always real specific in our remaining couple of minutes. Just keep that in the back of your mind that things which the leaders of the groups do, well, there are also things that the faculty members and others can do as well. Let's return back to Dr. Tinto. He came out with a short piece here in 2019, and he was talking about the importance of community. Students who feel like they're a part of a community are going to have higher, ha higher satisfaction and are more going to be more likely to persist and graduate from college. What is it that it takes in order for students to experience this belonging? Well, they need to feel like they're valued. They need to have frequent interactions. They need to see that the college is welcoming to them and they feel included. Learning occurs best inside of communities. In fact, that's if you look at Dr. Tinto's work in, say, the last 15 years or so, that's been one of the biggest themes is learning communities because he believes that the research is clear that whenever students are organized and have clearly structured learning activities together, they're going to be more engaged they're going to be more likely to learn and to persist in their college career then. So for them, that's the reason why Dr. Tinto thinks that belonging is so important. In the talk that I did with the students in Australia in October 2019, I stopped the lecture and had them work in groups at their tables along with other staff members and I think there were some other faculty members as well and I asked them please identify what are some of the non-academic challenges for students and what are some of the solutions. In the rest of my talk I've incorporated that contributions from them and put those into the PowerPoint slides. They had excellent recommendations of things that they've already been doing and using successfully with the students that they have in their study group programs. And then I incorporated my material as well. So I don't end up differentiating. I just want to be really clear. A lot of the specifics that we're going to quickly explore in the next couple of minutes well, those are the ones that the student study group leaders, the past leaders, they're already doing successfully with their students in New Zealand and Australia because that was the majority of who it was that was at the conference. Well, the first one is, is what is it that we can do to make sure we have a welcoming and encouraging environment? Students want to be recognized. They want to be understood. It's things that are as simple as greeting the students individually as they enter the study group room. So don't just simply 
step back, let them call, come in, actually be at the door. I remember I did that as a faculty member and greeting students because you can see the looks in their eyes. This is a new experience for first-time college students when they're walking into my classroom. That's the reason why I sent them all emails ahead of time. And there are lots of my other colleagues here at the University of Minnesota did the exact same thing. And students reported back to us how important it was for people to reach out to them and to welcome them. Because for them, they may have been high-performing students in secondary schools, but this is a whole new environment. For many of them, they've moved from other parts of the state of Minnesota or other states or other countries, and this is a completely new environment for them. Arrange the furniture so people can see each other. I know some places you can't move the furniture inside the classrooms, but it's so critical about making it so that you can see each other, use icebreakers in order to be able to uh, take just a couple of minutes. It's a great way to help learn names of more students inside the class because it's not only important for the study group leader to learn the names, it's also important for all the participants to learn each other's names inside of the groups then. It's really important, as I said, to make this place really friendly and relaxed. And that's something that the study group leaders can do. A second thing is developing personal relationships with the students. Well, that goes back to that welcoming part about learning student names, the first names. That is so critical because for a number of these students, because we know from the research, they are very socially isolated, which seems counterintuitive, but it's not. It's not true. Students, because of other time demands or difficulty managing their time, they don't have lots and lots of people who they knew and interacted with like perhaps they did in secondary schools. Making sure you understand about the cultural background of your students as we increase the diversity and the uh, internationalization of our curriculum you know, for me in Minnesota, it was important for me to know about the background of my Somali and my Hmong and my Nigerian and Ethiopian and Eritrean and the rest of the students, Chinese students. It's important I understand something about their culture, a little bit about their history. Also, having opportunities for people to be able to share about themselves during the study group sessions. Now, we're not talking about spending the entire time, but we're talking about ways that you can incorporate conversations, and maybe part of this goes into the icebreakers, where people are sharing about something about their culture or family, pets, hobbies, sports, whatever. Find different ways that we can start making connections with people because it also helps me as a faculty member I also had office hours, but also a lot of study group programs. They also are creating study group programs, or for some of them, they're using social media in order to develop more conversation with students. And I found that students really liked coming by just to talk with me for just 10 or 15 minutes. And that's all I would set as the time. In fact, sometimes for some of the students who were kind of nervous, I said you could come in in groups of two and three. And not only could I get a chance to interact with them, but also they had a chance to meet other students inside the class who they've never met before. This whole word up here of normalization, it's easy for students to think they're the only ones dealing with challenges of mental health, physical health, academic challenges, social disruption. Uh, one of the biggest things that I saw in the uh, remarks from the students whenever they were generating the list of uh, what were the barriers and challenges for uh, school, and they were talking about the life school work balance. It was really hard. It's something that I think sometimes older faculty members like me, we had a much different experience when we went through school. The issue is not, do you have a part-time job? That's insultive. It's how many part-time jobs do you have? And it's really pretty shocking to see on um, what they're needing to do and paying for the enormous cost for textbooks and all the rest. 
it's really helpful if the leader does some sharing about what are some of the challenges that they're dealing with and how they're dealing with them. Once again, we're breaking down that barrier. It's normal to have the challenges. And also, the leader can share also about how maybe they didn't feel like they really belonged here at the institution. And that's the concept of impostorship. I'm an imposter. I really don't really belong at this institution. That is a more common concept that many students and faculty members also have. It's, you don't often think about faculty members as having feelings of self-doubt and feeling like maybe they don't belong. I always made a point to share about that uh, on the first day of class, and I could see the reaction in their faces because on the first day, the students are walking in and they're thinking, well, here's the so-called expert and life is easy for this person, has all the answers, it's been smooth, and I just hope that I can hang on. The students like it whenever I share about some of my own academic challenges and how I dealt with them and have persisted through them. And that helps to make me more real and it also helps to normalize the challenges they have, and it serves as a great place for some short conversations on how do you deal with it. So once again, as I talk about some of these issues that can be talked about during study group sessions, I'm not suggesting that we ought to go and just spend the entire time on these. Maybe you need to spend a few minutes. Maybe you need to spend half an hour. Frankly, what we know from the research is these are some of the kinds of things that actually lead for students to decide, I don't belong in college. Seems odd, doesn't it, that sometimes the most important things are not necessarily what happened inside of the class lecture, but of what's going on whenever they go back to wherever it is that they live, and they're trying to make sense out of the readings, the activities, the lecture notes, or the lack of lecture notes, handling the work responsibilities, dealing with roommates, all of these things are so tumultuous. This idea about how everyone fails this is a concept that I've not been as aware of, but I was able to learn more about this whenever I was interacting with some of the staff uh, and whenever I was at the Australian conference. And that is students are making an uh, incorrect assumption. And that is whenever I fail, that actually means that I am a failure. That would be a really valuable conversation to have because, once again, students who drop out of college very well may be doing so because they've had what I would call some speed bumps. They've had some assignments or a major exam where they uh, did not do very well. And then they start to draw conclusions about themselves, and they start thinking of themselves as a failure. They think about this as a character trait. When actually, they need to think about whenever they fail as an event. We can overcome the events. It's pretty tough to overcome whenever you believe you're a failure, and it's really a character trait about you. So that's the reason why it can be so helpful inside of these study group sessions to be able to have this conversation because everybody is experiencing this. And whenever students feel like they're the only one that's having difficulty, then those are the ones that suddenly disappear and they don't come back to class anymore. They don't come back to the study review sessions and they just simply become invisible and then they don't re-enroll. And that's really a tragic event because if we can give them a place where they feel like it's a safe place for them to 
the share. If the leader can be somebody who shares about their experiences, just like for I, whenever I talked about my experiences of failure, then that helps the students to feel better and they realize that they're not the only ones. Making sure that students have an active role, that's another way to make sure that they have a sense of belonging. There's quite a number of PowerPoint slides here. I'm not gonna go through and read through all of these, but it's the reason why the activity is so important. Students need to feel like they're a valuable part of the group. And we need to make sure that they have roles, small roles, low risk kinds of roles, but it's critical that they be involved because if they are, then they're going to feel like they belong. And that's the reason why uh, probably most uh, study group programs talk an awful lot about breaking up groups into small groups, working individually, then in pairs, then in threes, or some other number, and then eventually rehearsing enough until you're working as a large group then. But once again, it's really critical that we not only have active roles, but also we give some reinforcements. We need to give some specific praise to the student. What is it that they did behaviorally that was positive? There's always something that was positive. That was something that I always looked forward to as a teacher is that I would give feedback to the students and make sure it was very specific. It might only be one sentence. Students reacted well to that. They don't react very well to just general praise. Well, that was really good. They'd like to know what it was that they did that was good. So that's the reason why I just wanted to highlight specific praise is so important. Rotating the tasks around, because you'll get some people who are inside the study group sessions that love to talk. And they're really smart and they're articulate. And they have lots of experience with this. And sometimes the quiet students, they just kind of sit in the background. And they're careful. They're observing. They're listening carefully. Let's find ways to make sure that everybody has some sort of a role. We rotate around, give specific praise for them. Relevance. Students feel a lot more belonging if they feel like there's something that makes a difference for them. What is it about the class session that was important today? How does it relate to my future academic plans? Does this relate to classes in the next academic term or a year from now or in graduate school? How does things that I'm dealing with inside of class today help me with a future job? All of that is critical in making sure that students see that what is going on is relevant. And that is something that study group leaders are able to do. Classroom teachers like me, sometimes we make the assumption, well, it's easy for students to figure out what's important, how to apply it. I'm not really responsible for drawing all the connections. Well, actually, I think we kind of are, myself, and as I did that more towards the end of my career, I received more positive feedback from students in the end of the term evaluations of me because of behaviors that I did. There were specific things that I was doing, but inside of this particular slide here, it talks about what is it that we can do to make the connections, what are the major points how do you connect previous and upcoming academic units? How does this make sense with everyday life? Whenever I, as a student, can see those kinds of connections, then I feel like I belong in school because I am now finding material that is personally relevant to me. And if I feel like that, then I'm going to be much more likely to feel that this is valuable and that I belong in this place. There was a song of an American uh, band uh, called uh, 38 Special, probably not the best choice of names for bands nowadays with gun violence and the rest, but let's just kind of focus on the song if we could. And it came out of a movie called Teachers. You can find that on YouTube. 
but the theme song was called Teacher, Teacher, and I just simply pulled out one of the stanzas. I watched and listened to this music video every single academic term before the term started because I thought about this. And I wanted to know, is this what I'm doing? Am I making this class relevant? Am I giving them what it is that they need? And it really reminded me about relevance. In fact, there was a couple of academic terms where we actually listened to the song during the class, and then I let the students write a job description for me. You know, on the first day of class, it's pretty easy uh, to uh, share the course syllabus and explain all the requirements, and it's a tumultuous times, and the students are trying to stay on top. I eventually learned and did things in order to make this a much more positive experience for the first day of class. One of the things that students liked was whenever they wrote their job expectations for me. And it was really informative. And I took them and then placed them up on the website for the course then. So I could be publicly responsible to them for what it was that they told me that they wanted. And these are the kinds of things that the students were telling me that they wanted out of me. They wanted to understand what was the point, well, how was it relevant, what difference did it make, What's the main point? All of those. And they, in many ways, over the course of 40 years, the very best professional development for me as a teacher was listening to my students. Well, what's the evidence of effectiveness by not only the participants in the groups, but also the leaders? A researcher who has a model that a lot of people have used for evaluating college student outcomes. Chickering primarily focused on post-secondary education. I won't go through and read through all seven of the items here, but I think he gives us a 10 point in order to identify what are the things other than grades that students get out of the experience. Now, developing competencies, while you can develop and demonstrate competencies in other ways other than just simply examinations. But just simply looking at the other six of them up here, I think that he really provides a really good model. So, what is it that we have discovered from doing research over the past 30 years about student study groups? Over 50 studies have come out and looked at what is the outcomes for the participants. And they tend to follow into these four categories. More engagement, development of interpersonal skills, enhanced critical thinking skills, and also feeling much more confident and comfortable inside of the classroom. So those are things that can be discovered through various ways. In terms of the study group leaders, what is it that they get out of the experience? Well, there's about 40 plus studies that have revealed lots of information about what is it that they get out of it. And just some of them, some of them in terms of developing a new idea about what they want to do for a future vocation seeing themselves as a leader, not just simply using leadership skills, but actually seeing themselves as a leader and also seeing themselves as a professional. Identity development is right on the cutting edge whenever I read the literature about what it is that we want to see students going through. Well, we've had studies for decades that have been telling us that that's been going on. Developing your project management skills, time management, interpersonal, conflict management, leadership, and then all the rest of them, public speaking, presentation skills, and the rest of them there. What I find is that lots of study group leaders, they don't tend to think about all of these because they're so outwardly focused on helping the student participants do well on exams, see them grow in confidence, do better, they sometimes don't reflect about what are all the things that they're experiencing. But the research is very clear that these things are happening. And once again, this is whenever you talk about co-curricular 
These are really powerful outcomes whenever you're dealing with college administrators about why it is they ought to support a peer study group program and even put more money into it and hire more study group leaders because it's not just simply about what's happening to the participants. It's also a wonderful personal development program, a co-curricular learning experience for the peer study group leaders themselves. So, while well, there's all those things, how is it that we're going to collect this information? You know, it's easy to collect the great information, and that's something that the uh, primarily the peer staff is going to be in charge of because of confidentiality of the grades and the rest, but how is it that we're going to collect all that information from those previous two pages? Well, there's lots of tools that are out there. Some things are really simple, and that is journaling every single week for the peer study group leaders and for them to be reflecting about what it is it that they're experiencing. Maybe the peer uh, staff can come up with some prompting questions. Like maybe one week it would be, have you reconsidered any of your career plans as a result of what's going on? Or maybe another question might be, how would you describe your level of confidence about the academic material that you've been reviewing for the other students? There's all kinds of prompting questions, but the key here is we can, through the journals, we can reflect not only about the leader, but also for changes in the participants. So the leader can talk about particular students and how they see changes occurring with them over the course of the academic term. That is enormously powerful. That's called qualitative research. Quantitative research would be the grade differences. Qualitative research would be looking at changing behavior. Observation notes that you make as a study group leader whenever you go and observe other people's programs, their study group sessions. That's a real common practice is to send a study group leader to observe another study group leader for one or two of their sessions and then for them to get together and talk about what they saw. Well, also the staff members, oftentimes they're in there observing what's going on during the sessions. Well, once again, here you've got their notes that they're making. Well, that's evidence. Obviously, surveys of both the leaders and the participants, interviews, and maintaining portfolios. And as I put up there at the very top, it may be at your institution you'll need to have some sort of permission given to gather some kinds of information uh, just simply find out what those are. The, your peer study staff program, will, um, staff members would be the ones that would be in charge of obtaining those permissions and such. There's also faculty members out there that would be delighted probably to be involved as a partner with you. Now, what are we going to use all of this information for? Well, as I said... We can end up using this data, identify the themes of what is it. You know, a theme is simply we've seen a whole bunch of examples of something and they all kind of collect together and they have a common theme or a common thread that runs through them. Well, you can end up identifying some quotations and using those in reports. Uh, this is what you call non-grade evidence. It's really powerful. It really speaks to faculty members because they want to know what do students say that they're getting out of the experience. I mean, anyone can read a spreadsheet and look at the average grades for the participants and the non-participants or uh, the participants who come a lot versus the participants who come some versus those who don't come at all. But whenever we can actually get the words of the students, both from the leaders as well as the participants, that really speaks powerfully. You can end up using this, obviously, in presentations and conferences. You can end up posting some of this anonymous information through social media sites. You can create study training materials, and I'll give you two examples here in just a moment. 
These are a couple of documents that the students, the study group leaders at the University of Minnesota created. And for those of you who are looking at this on uh, YouTube, you can see the web address down at the very bottom, so you can download these documents. If you're listening to this through the podcast, you'll need to go into the um, PowerPoint slides, which you could download. And also, I'll be posting these documents, actually, to the podcast as well. One of the documents, and these are totally made by the students, the student study group leaders. One simply shares what are all the strategies that they use to engage students in. Another of the documents is really based on their, um, their uh, journaling and what are some of the lessons that they learned from the experience, what are some of the suggestions that they have on how to be able to manage study groups and to be able to make them more effective. Well, this all comes not from me as a faculty member. It doesn't come from the staff. It comes from the past leaders themselves. They are enormously powerful. Students talking to students is always better than faculty just talking to students. Well, quickly, as we're ending up our time here, I just want to give a couple of things that I've learned along the way after 40 years. In case you want to uh, see my more complete um, reflection about this, um, go to the website there, as you can see. But let me just go ahead and hit two highlights. It's been 40 years. I can't believe it. It seems so fast. And I guess my basic comment to you is embrace the journey. It is so unpredictable. So many unusual things have occurred. Things that I never would have guessed. As I told students in my uh, history class at the University of Minnesota when I was talking about an impostorship and feelings of inadequacy, I said, you know, this is a pretty high prestigious place to get into. Congratulations for being admitted to a Research One um, intensive institution with a high expectation and high marks in order to be able to be admitted. I said, the only way that I got into Minnesota was that I got hired here as a faculty member. My grades weren't so hot coming out of high school. So I actually might not have been admitted to this place as a high school student. I don't know. I'm not disingenuous when I say that because my grades weren't stellar. But I'm trying to communicate to the students it's so unpredictable. And I think that's part of what I really liked about the... Um, the movie here with Tom Hanks. Um, Forrest Gump, uh, either you love it or you hate it. Uh, I think it's an adorable film. It's a wonderful, I think, um, metaphor for what life is like. And uh, one of the big metaphors is the feather. And I won't take more time than that in case you want to see more about that. Uh, go back to my previous slide where I talked about how there's a website where you can actually see my reflection and I actually talk about it and I actually have some movie clips inside of there. Well, this is December of 2019. The ninth Star Wars film in the series is about to come out here in, what, about three weeks or so. Uh, I've seen them all. Some of them have been great, some of them not. Um, this is number nine that's about ready to come out. And never fear, since Disney owns the rights, they'll be making spin-off films of Star Wars for the next hundred years, probably. Well, there's lots of quotations from Yoda. Um, and this is one of them here. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. I actually kind of saw that as kind of helpful advice for me because it helps me to understand how come I was able to do what I've done in my life is that I made a full commitment to what it was I was up to. And I've been a very fortunate person. I come from, I guess, a privileged background. Um, so I, I recognize that, uh, but also I worked at it. But also, here's another quotation that oftentimes people don't pay attention to whenever Yoda was trying to get Master Luke to understand. 
and he talks about this whole issue of the greatest teacher failure is. Isn't it interesting thinking about it? Here's all these superheroes of the future, and they're dealing with the issue of fail and failure. And that's what I just wanted to circle back to, because I was told this is a really important concept that a lot of students are struggling with, that whenever they experience academic turbulence, they feel like it's a character trait that they really are a failure and they don't belong. And I think that's what this little quotation from Yoda is, the greatest teacher failure is. The key is, are we learning from the experience? And I have failed a lot. And in fact, I'm working on a talk on that about all my failures and how they had an impact on where I'm going to. So in case you're interested, I hope to post that sometime during 2020. And you'll be able to find it in YouTube in case you're interested. Just simply do a search for Arendelle uh, Fail or Failure. And that'll be able to bring up the video. But it's really given me a lot of time to think about. Well, we finally have reached the end. I would love to continue the conversation with you. I've given you here my email address. I've given you two web addresses here for all of these resources, all of these handouts that are related to my time at the conference in Australia. Well, those are all contained here uh, at the website uh, of um, z.umn.edu slash Australia 2019, my personal website. Um, and also, I would be happy to continue the conversation. We could do a Skype call together. Um, I find that I learn a lot more whenever I talk with others, with students, with staff members, and faculty members. Going to Australia uh, this October was an enormous impact upon me. I'm still reflecting and thinking about the experience. And it'll have an impact on the way that I do writing and talking in the future. Um, it was such a wonderful experience. And it just reminds me, getting out and seeing other people and listening is so critical. Well, thanks for listening today. I hope my words are useful in your work in helping students to achieve their dreams. Best wishes to you.